So how Korean is K-pop? In the next um, 25, 30 minutes or so, I will give you um, perhaps a more like scholarly or academic perspective on, on K-pop. And what I will first do is to get us all started. <laughs> I will play you a couple of seconds from Psy's Dad Dad. Some of you may have already watched it on YouTube. It was launched, I think, um, maybe a month ago, and it has already garnered 217 million and more views. So just as a prelude to my to my talk, let's let's listen in, okay? And it's featuring Suga of BTS. So for all the BTS fans among you, um, you will see a Suga. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Whoa, yeah. Whoa, whoa. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Whoa, yeah. Oh. Okay, so this video basically already shows us many, many distinct features of K-pop, and I will explain many of those in, in the forthcoming minutes. Now, what I will be doing um, is, is basically a lecture composed of three sections or segments, okay? So I will first talk about how we can define K-pop, and then talk a little bit about the historical context, and finally, I will talk about traditional elements and, and confusion values that are supposedly related to, to the K-pop industry, okay? And throughout these segments, I will show you music videos. And I know that there are many uh, K-pop fans in the audience, right? And I, I know that you enjoy listening to the music and enjoy the dance moves and the songs. But what we're going to do in the next couple of minutes is take a more like scholarly approach or academic approach to K-pop, okay? And, and I hope this will enrich your understanding of K-pop and where it's coming from. All right, so first segment, definition of K-pop. Now, K-pop is a capitalist mode of production. It is a style of training, um, producing and advertising and also performing popular music as, as it is currently perfected in South Korea. And many of you may already familiar, may be already familiar with the term idol. So K-pop singers are usually referred to as idols. And what they do is with K-pop, they present a new style of presentation and performance. And languages in K-pop used to be mostly Korean, but in the last, I would say, five years or so, it's been increasingly also in English. So we have a mix of languages, English and Korean. And K-pop is genre fluid and ocular centric. So what I mean by that is ocular, ocular centric is that, um, you know, the visual, the visuals are very, very important. So with all the music videos, the dance moves, um, the makeup, the fashion, all that is very, very important in K-pop. And it is genre fluid. So K-pop is not a genre. It is actually um, composed of many, many different genres. And we will be listening in to Girl Generation, I Got a Boy, Son Yoshide, and we, you will hear different components of like hip hop, pop rock, and EDM. EDM means um, electronic dance music. Okay, so that is another feature of K-pop that it actually has these these different um, genres even within us one song. Okay, so let's listen in. Hey yo, GG. Oh, 
So did you see the different stages, right? There was a little bit of hip hop, then the move to pop rock, and then lastly it was EDM. Okay, so this, this is what I mean with the different genres within a within song. This is the, the second segment of my talk. Okay, on the right hand side you see a photograph of the first K-pop band in the history of K-pop, Sotteji and the Boys. 1995 was the first was the year when, when, their, when the first song was released, uh, Come Back Home. And K-pop has basically been around for more than 25 years. Prior to K-pop, there was of course popular music in South Korea, but it was mainly US American music and Korean so-called trot music. And trot is this kind of it's kind of four four backbeat um, music that is actually coming from Japanese uh, Japanese enka music. Okay, so these were like the two main um, types of music that were that were around. And and Sotoji and the Boys brought in hip hop, dance, visual elements in music videos and fashion. So all these things that we define as K-pop today, right? And there were many um, things going on in South Korea at the time, um, socially, politically, culturally, that led to the emergence of K-pop. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. So under 1993, um, Korea actually did not, South Korea did not actually have a democratically elected president. The first one was elected in 93, it was Kim Yong-sam. Until then, popular culture was under government control. So lyrics were censored, for instance. And um, so that was on the political side. And then in the 1990s, we also have um, the, the more broader distribution of like color TVs in South Korea. We have a rising middle class that could afford buying cassette tape video, um, cassette tape recorders, CD recorders. We have the expansion of norebang or karaoke in, in South Korea. So it was the establishment of democracy in 93. It was the advancement of technology with color TV. We have the creation of CDs. We have the Walkman. And, and basically musicians were no longer tied to broadcast and, and they could instead produce a unique product without input from the government. That was a major change. And then another very important aspect is that the travel, the foreign travel ban was lifted. Believe it or not, until 1989, it was very difficult for South Koreans to travel abroad because it was very difficult to get a passport. And that changed. And um, at that point, many young people got a passport and they went to Europe, they went to the US and they studied film and media. And then um, they, they, you know, after a couple of years, they went back to South Korea and they brought all that that knowledge um, back and 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 gave that to the um, emerging music and film industry. So, one of these pioneers um, that really brought K-pop to into a, into a start was Suman Lee, Lee Suman, the founder and director of SM Entertainment. And um, you may have heard his name before. So he was actually a singer and entertainer in the eighties. And then in the 90s, you know, once he was able to get his own passport, he went to Cal State Northridge. 
He studied um, U.S. popular music and film and media studies. And then he returned to South Korea, founded his company, and he has been in the K-pop industry ever since. Really, really successful with um, HOT. Um, HOT and Soteji and Du Bois were basically rivals in 95, 96. I vividly remember that because I was in Korea at that time. So I remember those two bands and going to concerts to both of, of, both of them. And then there was SES, one of the first female K-pop bands um, launched in 1997. So yeah, Suman Lee is basically the, the K-pop pioneer, so, so to speak, um, from the 90s until today. So let's listen, let's listen in to Sotiji and to Boys. And what I want you to would keep in mind while listening to the song is that it has strong, their music has strong subcultural features. And it it instantly became a hit because it was a powerful expression to the discontent of young people within South Korea's very rigid and competitive educational system. It's basically a song about someone who um, uh, escapes home and just doesn't want to come back, but it's kind of the parent's voice that's saying, you know, you must come back home, right? Um, and so this song points out the status of teenagers as a social minority in Korea and that music could play a central role in their self-expression. Okay, so let's let's just listen in for a couple of seconds to, so you get an idea of the very first K-pop song. Okay, yes, so for those of you who are familiar with 1990s US pop music, <laughs> may recall that there was a very, very famous song by Cypress Hill, Insane in the Membrane. If you don't know that song, definitely look it up on YouTube. The beats and the sounds are very, very similar. Okay. Um, but what was new with um, the Sotoji and the Boys version of that song is, of course, the lyrics and the choreography and the fashion. And, and that's what K-pop is so known for, right? The choreography and the fashion. And, you know, looking at this picture, um, I know you may not believe this, but they were actually fashion idols in the 90s. And I remember that, you know, those Oshkosh like pants and the hats were really, really fashionably, fashionable that, back then. And I remember buying a hat, a kind of Sotoji uh, kind of hat. And, you know, I, I remember those days. So, so that was the beginning. And then, yeah, what happened in the late 1990s was that a big financial crisis in South Korea and other tiger states in, in East Asia and South Asia is called the IMF uh, crisis. And there was a there was there were major changes going on at that time in South Korea. So first of all, until 1997, the middle class goal in South Korean society had been get a job at a Jebol company. So Jebol means, I mean, you know, large conglomerates like Samsung or Hyundai. So that was the goal, right? But then because of the crisis, people realized, wait a second, a white collar job at a Jebol is actually not secure. <laughs> and um, working in the entertainment industry had not been very much like highly regarded by parents until then. But because of the crisis, I think um, parents became more like flexible and, and they allowed kids to actually um, become idle trainees and, you know, become more active in the, in the entertainment industry. And so what we see in the mid, like in the 90s is political change, technological development, a larger pool of trainees. So there was a little bit more competition, right, among trainees. And then all this expertise from people who had studied abroad was coming back into Korea. And so all that basically contributed to the emergence of Hallyu, which is the Korean word for like Korean wave, right? And that is a collective term for the international popularity of South Korean pop culture. And that includes film, that includes music. So K-pop is actually part of, of the Hallyu uh, movement of the, of the wave, of the Korean wave. OK, now another factor for the popularization of K-pop, particularly from the 2010s onward, is YouTube. So just like Psy's video that we just watched in the beginning of this talk, all the big K-pop bands, they released their new singles on YouTube. 
and all the interaction with fans, as you know, K-pop has a very strong fan base. It all happens through YouTube in most cases. And then there are many reality shows, live broadcasting on YouTube. And as we just saw Ethereal, I, I think you guys did a great show. And groups like Ethereal and Wavy and others, they upload their dance videos to YouTube, right? And we basically have, um, in addition to the K-pop industry, we have adjacent K-pop industry industries actually and 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 dance videos by fans uploaded by fans it's just another type of like adjacent k-pop industry that um that we see okay all right now i'm getting to the final section of my um brief um comments about k-pop what what are traditional elements in k-pop right and let me just give you two like brief examples of, of what i mean by that and why this is important for us to study now, we're going to look at One Us's Lit, which was um, released in 2019. And I want you to take um, special attention to the visual, the oral, and the textual connections to Korean traditions. And before we get to the video clip, let me just point out this, this section here in this uh, screenshot from the video that seems to indicate some kind of a um, a window or a door, right, with kind of this lattice pattern. Now, if we look at two pieces, two beautiful pieces from the um, collection of the museum, we actually see a similar kind of lattice, lattice window in the back of one of these um, oblong prints, right? So there's definitely this connection made to, to the past, to the Korean past. Now, what are these two woodblock prints? They were created by a Scottish woman, actually, Elizabeth Keith, who lived in Japan for a couple of years in the early, um, early 20th century. And she also visited Korea and, you know, she, she took note of what was going on around her. And then she translated that knowledge visually in, in, in woodblock printing and um, also studied Japanese woodblock printing, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot we could say about her actually. And on the left hand side, you see a scholar, a Confucian scholar dressed in traditional um, government official like garb. And in the back, we have a landscape screen kind of framing the scene. And on the right hand side, we have two um, people like male uh, um, individuals also sitting on the floor and playing a game of chess, right? And again, this is framed in this kind of traditional um, architectural setting with the lattice window in the back. Now, I'm going to play the beginning of the video and I want you to keep in mind those different visual or and lyrics um, that are kind of related to traditional Korean culture. So in terms of visuals, um, observe what you see. Okay, so I want you to see, can you see the traditional palace architecture? Can you see the Buddhist temple painting, the Tanshong painting? That is, Tanshong means, um, is, is a reference to the type of decoration that was used to, um, that was used to decorate the, the upper part of, of Buddhist architecture, for example. So see if you can see that in the video, okay? And then the traditional costumes that the singers are, are wearing. And in terms of oral elements, listen very closely and, and check if you can identify string and wind instruments that seem to be not kind of Western, but more like traditional instruments. And then in terms of lyrics, actually, um, they are making a reference to Niliria, which is a traditional Korean folk song. And then there are also quite a few non-lexical syllables like olshigu, which means like right on or love it. So there are these kinds of syllables that are um, kind of interjections during a traditional Korean music performance like pansori or Korean traditional opera, where the audience says things like olshigu, jota or something to kind of encourage the singers, the performers. And so you will, if you listen very closely, you will hear those syllables during, during the performance. Okay, so let's listen in. Gotcha. Uh. Gotcha. 
都无聊，皮皮都无啊，小仔都中，旁边比起大哥我，我的脚跟着比车，中年人哥拿车，白起的咱能得路嘛，能过路噶。Okay, so do you remember? <laughs> do you remember looking at some of those elements that I just described? Did you recognize them during the video? You did? Okay, great. So, um, you know, there are different approaches that we can take towards analyzing these traditional elements, right? So let me be um, very critical about the ways how traditional elements are incorporated in this particular video. Um, it is kind of a fantasy pop styling of traditional culture, right? So the danchong, for instance, this type of danchong would be hung at the ceiling, but here we see it on the wall. The, um, the, the, what they're wearing is not really a hanbok, but it's kind of a fancy pop version of hanbok, perhaps, right? So I think it's good that we see those traditional elements, but at the same time, we need to, deep, we need to dig deeper if we really wanted to understand the type of aesthetics and, and traditions that were important in Korean culture and before the, in, like, in pre-modern times, okay? So let me show you um, a couple of seconds from um, another video, Dechita, that came out in 2020. Um, it's a suga of BTS um, and who produced and, and created um, the song for this video. And this is kind of interesting too. So I would say it's a little bit of a better production because it's taking an actual sample. You will hear the actual sample of a marching song for kings and high-ranking officials from the Joseon period. And then it combines traditional musical instruments, the pipe, the drum, the gong. And if you look at the video background, um, it provides a fairly authentic, like pre-1900 market scene and the royal palace scene. Of course, you have the um, the rap, right, which is which is like Western style. But um, I would say this is maybe a, a more successful rendering of incorporated tradition into MVs. Okay, so let's listen in for a couple seconds before wrapping up. <laughs> Okay, I think you know what I'm getting at, right? <laughs> okay, so let's move on to, uh, I think it's one of the last slides here. 
um, the confusion mindset. Okay, I wanted to have a slide or two about that because whenever I, you know, I teach K-pop here at the University of Kansas, and whenever I teach it, I get comments by students who say, "Oh, yeah, it's all because um, the Koreans are such, you know, hardworking people, and because they have a strong like Confucian mindset, and 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 so these K-pop bands, they work very hard and very are very diligent, and that's that's all because of their Confucian background, and that's why they're so successful and popular, right? <laughs> but um, I take issue with that kind of a statement. Okay, we have to dig a little bit deeper, um, be a little bit um, more concerned with um, how we use certain words. Okay, and Confucianism is a big word that can explain basically everything and nothing. <laughs> okay, so the question for you is now, you know, would you agree with that kind of statement or not? Okay, well, let me give you some food for thought here. First of all, why are K-pop bands successful? Well, it has largely something to do with discipline, right? In order to become a musician, you, you know, it requires years and years of hard training, regardless of cultural background. So discipline has nothing to do with Confucianism per se, okay? And then when we look at, like, when we compare a Joseph period Confucian scholars goals in life and, and, and a contemporary South Korean K-pop idol, and I'm giving you the South, the, the Korean, the Confucian scholar that we just saw in Elizabeth Keith's Whoopla print, and then on the other side, you see Suga of BTS. So if you compare these two, the purpose and the motives are actually very different. So a Joseon period scholar's goal, so Joseon means like, you know, a scholar who lived in 14th to 19th century Korea. Um, the ultimate goal was neo-Confucian self-cultivation. So you, will be, you wanted to become a well-rounded person that would serve the state and become a state official. The ultimate goal was to become a state official. And seeking fame was like something that they definitely did not want to have. In contrast, K-pop idols, you know, they um, they want to become famous, they want to be popular, and they want to, they have to actually create revenue for their companies. And another framework that we see with K-pop is that K-pop singers are in an exploitative process, right? They are objectified as commodities. They are only as, like, they're only valuable as long as they are young and beautiful, and once all those BTS members go into the military, we'll see what will happen to the band, right? Usually when a K-pop band is, has like male singers and they all have to go to the military, that's basically the end of the band, right? So very different goals, okay? But one thing they have in common, and that is very strong moral values, okay? So K-pop, singers are very much expected to live the life of a, of a social role model. So my conclusive remarks, um, K-pop idols have to fulfill a social role model. They have to um, function as cultural ambassadors to South Korea. Um, K-pop is a style of training, um, of producing and performing popular music. It covers various music genres. I would say K-pop presents the best visuals and best dance performances since Michael Jackson. I mean, you just saw the beautiful group performing on stage and we also just watched many MVs. I mean, the K-pop really has perfect synchronization, right? And um, looking at this from like an, an outsider's perspective, I'm actually um, from, from Berlin, Germany, and I you know, I'm looking at US pop music and Korean music from like from a European's perspective, so to speak. So we, with K-pop success, we basically see a reversal of long established cultural flows from the West, particularly from the US to the rest of the world. And basically now it's reversed. Now it's K-pop, now it's Korea bringing music into the West, right? And um, there are many things that that we can contribute to k-pop and one of this of these trends is more and more people sign up for korean language classes and for classes at um, universities all around the world to learn more about korea and i think that's great i think 
the music videos that we saw that incorporate these traditional values make people perhaps curious about Korea's past. And then they can, you know, take classes with me and with other scholars all around the world and learn more about Korean culture and traditions. And I hope that in the long run, this will lead to a deeper understanding of Korea in the West. And that's it. Thank you so much for listening in. And I look forward to more presentations and the discussions with a Q&A with you. Thank you so much again for the invitation.